Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you all could join us for today's webinar. My name is Keith Spencer, and I am one of our career experts here at FlexJobs. FlexJobs, for those of you who don't know, has been the most trusted and leading site for remote job listings since 2007. And we are thrilled to have as our guest presenter today, Marcel Yeager of Career Valet, who will be discussing how to take control of your career. Before we dive into the presentation with Marcel, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed out to you later this week. This will be a 60 minute webinar that will include the presentation with Marcel followed by a live audience Q&A at the end. If you'd like to ask Marcel a question, please make sure to type it into the Q&A section, not the chat section. You can also use the thumbs up feature in the Q&A section if you see a question you would like to hear the answer to so that we know which questions are the most popular. We likely won't be able to answer every question today, but we will do our best to address as many as we can in the time we have together. All right, I will go ahead and turn things over to Marcel. Welcome, Marcel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Keith. I'm very excited to be here, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, I'm going to talk like Keith said, and then we'll take questions at the end, so please feel free to put those into the Q&A. Um, so just uh, briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So you're like, who is this random person? Um, I founded Career Valet in 2012. And we do the thing that everybody hates to do, which is write resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, and help prepare for interviews to get people to the next level of their career. And we usually work with sort of mid and senior level to senior level professionals. 92% of the people we work with end up interviewing within a few weeks. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to add is before this, I did strategic communications consulting. So I had a lot of experience myself applying for jobs, writing tons and tons of resumes um, and cover letters, and also got my MBA. And that's when I decided to start my own company. Um, and I have lived in six countries and I have three young children. So that's just a little bit about me and let's get started. So today, obviously, we're taking talking about how to take control of your career. And these are kind of the four areas that I want to take you through. So the first you see here, we're going to talk about how you actually define success because it's different, of course, for everybody. Then we're going to talk about learning and feedback because that's a big piece of taking control of your career and getting to that next step. And then we're going to talk about growth opportunities and some maybe unique opportunities you might not have thought about for inside or outside of your organization. And lastly, how can you track your progress towards your goals and also advocate? So what are the best practices for advocating for yourself? So let's get to it. This is a, a statistic you might have seen in the original um, invite for the webinar. And it's 79% of managers have said they've told their direct reports what they need to do to get promoted, but only 50% of employees agree. So you can see what's the problem there, right? Like obviously there is not communication happening between these two sides and that's a problem. Furthermore, 75% of managers say their own managers help them develop skills needed to advance, but only 62% of non-managers say that. So th this is showing us that you can't rely on management or even mentors to take the wheel and help you direct your career. It's really up to you. So that's the subject of today's webinar. So, um, because we have a big audience today, I'm not going to ask you to, to answer this, but to yourself, I want you to answer this. Uh, the first question would be, do you have clear goals or objectives set in the current role that you have or your most recent role that you've had? Number two, do you know what you need to accomplish to get to the next level or to make some kind of a career pivot? Next, have you had a performance review in the past year? And when uh, I've, you know, talked about this with other audiences and clients, I find that it's kind of half and half. 
Some people say no to all three. Some people say yes, but it's usually a mix. So it's not, you know, the greatest situation that we could ask for. So we're going to try to fix this today. So how do we define success? So success means different things to different people. Like I said, you could have professional goals and personal goals, and most of us have both, right? So maybe success, and this is not an exhaustive list, of course, but maybe to you, it is to get to a higher level, get promoted. Maybe you want to make a ton of money. Maybe you want to change careers. Maybe you need more fulfilling work in your life and purpose. Do you want to be your own boss or would you rather just have flexibility and you don't really care about some of those things? At the same time, on the personal side, success could be having more time for yourself and your interests, maybe exercising, reading, spending time with loved ones, travel. It could be all different kinds of things. And kind of what I want you to think about is that the intersection of those two things is really what success means to you. So sometimes those things you need to kind of work on to line up to make sure you're doing what you should be doing. Um, and if you see me on the side here, I'm just making sure that I'm telling you all the things that I want to say with my notes um, that I have next to me. So moving right along, what I want you to also answer is drill down a little bit into your current or most recent role. So how are you currently evaluated? What is the definition of success in your role? And if you don't know, that's a conversation you should try to have with your boss. And we'll talk about other ways to do that if not. And then what are the goals that you need to achieve? So it's best, like I said, to do this with your manager. If it's not happening uh, or you don't have them, write down what you think those goals are. Maybe even talk to peers or others. You can use what I'm sure a lot of you know of as the SMART framework to do this, which stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound. But I don't want you to get too hung up on that because you don't necessarily need something quantifiable or a metric, you know, a number result. It can be qualitative. So it could be just that you saved time by improving a process. Um, that you want to, you know, enhance something within the company and there might not be a metric associated, but other examples might be create a new employee onboarding guide by quarter three or meet or exceed your sales target of 30%. So it could be a lot of different things. And what I want to say here is kind of my story from my strategic communications career and bring this in a little bit today to give you that picture uh, this happened to me where I came into a job, I realized very quickly that I should have been hired at the next level up, but I hadn't known enough before I was hired to negotiate that. And so I became very determined to make sure I could get to the next level at my six month performance review. And so uh, what I had to do was go to my uh, boss and try to figure out, okay, what are these goals? Let's make them very specific and achievable and you know, get them to agree to that. So that's kind of the story that I'm gonna be sharing today to show you that it's possible. So in terms of skills, you really wanna look at what soft and hard skills you have. Um, this could be, you know, soft skills are things like communication, or um, problem solving. I hate to call them soft skills because they are so important, but that's what people call them. So we're going to call them that, but they are super important today. Things like flexibility um, and that sort of thing. Then you want to look at the skills that you think you need. So that's what you need either for the next step in your career, or maybe it's the career pivot you've been thinking of making. And then you want to, you know, once you have that at the top of this T graph that you see here, if you want to use this structure, you can, you don't have to, then you want to think through the skills you want to spend time developing. And on that, I really want you to think about what you inherently value and what you really want to be excellent at. So not necessarily what you think you should do or need to do, but the ones 
you know, that are going to take you to where you want to go, that you're really interested in developing. And that's going to be the most important thing because otherwise, you know, you're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to be able to become really great at something unless you really love it. So that's something that you should consider. This is a tough one. I'm sure that many of you have tried doing it, if not all, but communicating up is very difficult to do. So if your boss has not been involved in setting your goals, bring your goals to them, as I said before. And part of that is, you know, really not relying on them to do it, creating it yourself, making a written plan with a timeline to help you achieve both short and long-term goals. And then you want to agree with them on a regular schedule for checking in. And again, don't rely on them to come to you if you say, I want to do this, you know, every three months or every quarter, basically, or every six months. You need to be in charge of that. So figure out what form should that take? Do they want a phone call? Do they want a meeting? Do they want it in an email? And then make sure it happens. Mark it on your calendar and make sure it happens. And then ask for opportunities to help you progress toward those goals too. Um, so it could be maybe, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but something like job shadowing or just going to meetings in a different department that you're interested in and things like that. So for example, in my case, I had to end up meeting my actual manager's boss because they were the rater for my performance reviews and the ultimate decision maker for promotions and bonuses and all that good stuff. So I went and met with her and I discussed, you know, that I wanted to be promoted and I needed to know what it was going to take to get me there at my next performance review. So we made these goals. We wrote about five to eight and they were very specific and they were time driven because I said, by this date, I'm going to make sure these are completed. And I made it very clear mutually that if these things were completed, I would be considered strongly for a promotion. And I was able to meet with her halfway and review my progress toward those goals and make sure we were on track. So let's talk a little bit about learning and feedback, which is something we often don't think about, but is really important. So probably a lot of you and you know might be thinking, well, I never get any feedback or you know, I don't know how to ask for it, or I don't feel comfortable asking for it. But it's super important, because it's something that you really can use to help you grow. So to help you get to that next step, or even to help you figure out how you're going to take those transferable skills and bring them into a new career, you always want to be developing. And then this shows when you're asking for feedback from your peers and your boss, it shows self motivation, it shows that you really are determined and confident to get where you want to go. So those are some of these soft skills that kind of are inferred by your actions. It's not things that you say, but by asking for feedback, you're giving that signal that you're this really thoughtful person and leader, and you're trying to make things work. And so the people that you want to ask are, of course, your boss, right? Um, but also peers and people you manage because they'll have different perspectives on working with you because of that working relationship. And then maybe even the person who held the job before, if there's any way to talk to them, that might also be helpful to kind of talk about their experiences and how you're doing and how all of that lines up. You can ask for like lessons learned and improvements um, at any point, right? But like good points to really do that at are a meeting that you've been at, you know, making comments, a presentation you've been given, maybe a report that you've written. And so one thing you might want to do is after something like that, just state yourself one thing that you think went well, and then ask for one thing that they thought, you know, you could work on. So keep it simple. You initiating by saying, you know, I thought this went well, but maybe I could improve this might also encourage them to help you. And you, of course, want to listen to each piece of advice and thank them for the feedback. And then you want to capture it because you, if you just kind of let it go, you might not remember all the things that you want to work on or, you know, and it's important also to like celebrate small successes. So if you're working on 
these things, then you should be celebrating them. So how can you do that? You can do that by tracking your progress and rating yourself on these different skills that you're trying to work on and then reviewing it regularly to make sure that you're getting to where you want to go and say, okay, I've been working on maybe my time management skills, but I don't think I'm doing as well on that as like communication skills. So I think I'm going to spend more time on figuring out how to make my time management skills better. And some of that can also come, I should say, through like your performance reviews. So if you have been given feedback from those, those might also be things that you want to capture as far as rating yourself continuously and reviewing on a regular basis. So here's a really big one where I think a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily take, um, take the time to do this. So in terms of growth opportunities, this next one is a really great thing that I want to encourage all of you to do if you haven't. And that's to increase your visibility. And what I mean here is increase your visibility among, you know, it could be your boss, your, you know, right, you know, the closest to you you could get, or people above them. And you want to think about who really intrigues you in the organization. Who do you want to get to know? Now, this could be, of course, externally as well um, or internally. So, you know, as you hear me talking now, it's going to sound like it's all internal, but you could do this the very same thing externally and identify people in different companies of interest um, or organizations where you might have an interest in working someday. Or so even somebody who you admire for their career path and you just want to get to know. You can also reach out to them and do something similar. So again, internally, this could be you want to advance, you might need to get to know certain people. And the way you can do this is a couple different things. One is to really become familiar with these identif you know, these individuals' bios. They may, like if you look at their LinkedIn profile, maybe they have a bio on the company website or even in, like on an internal site. Become familiar with them, get to know their background, and then maybe you want to strike up a conversation with them. Now, it's not always easy to do. I realize that. Um, but you might see them in an elevator. You know, if you're working remotely, I realize that's not necessarily possible to see them in a random meeting or an elevator. But if that's the case, you can also reach out and you could send an email. Um, you could contact their assistant and approach them and let them know, you know, something short and sweet, but that you, why you're interested in talking to them, reference something from their bio or LinkedIn profile, and, you know, try to strike up a conversation. So think of it, it's not a direct it's ask, like you're not trying to, inc by increasing your visibility, it doesn't mean going and saying, hey, I want to get to become a senior director now. And so how can I make that happen? you are just kind of learning. Think about it as learning, right? It's a growth opportunity. So you're seeking advice, you're seeking information, you're gathering, you're collecting. Um, you're not trying to push them into something. Now, great, maybe someday that'll result in it. That's the purpose of building these relationships and increasing your visibility. But that's not your ultimate goal right now. Another great way to increase your visibility is if there are volunteer opportunities at work you might get seen more readily by more of the senior leadership. For example, like a holiday party, you might volunteer to help out with that. Um, maybe there are like charity, there's charity work you could do, like going and building houses or volunteering in a soup kitchen where you can get more visibility or even the chance to talk with them at something like that. Sometimes recruiting, if you volunteer to help with hiring, you know, interviewing and recruiting activities or going to schools or other places where your company recruits, that's another way to do so and get recognized. So it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot to try to do this or even to ask for a direct meeting or phone call with some of these people. Um, and this is something, again, I tried to do in my consulting career. I tried to meet with my boss's boss regularly, like I said, to make sure that she understood here, I'm on track, I've done 
this training, I have accomplished this goal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I also tried to meet with another senior leader at her level as much as I could. Like if I would see her at a meeting, I would chat with her, you know, just just a general like social type of chat, nothing serious or professional. She did offer some advice every once in a while, um, you know, about being growing in the organization and being a woman in the organization. But if there were meetings, other meetings too, where I saw other senior leaders from the company, like a team all hands type meeting, I would, and again, this was years ago, so this was in person, but I would um, try to talk to them and just say hello, make sure they knew who I was, you know, and make some small talk. And again, now in the remote environment, you can still do that. You can ask for a chat on video, on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, whatever you use, or a phone call. So it's still possible. So I don't want you to think that it's not just because it used to be done differently in the old days. Um, another big thing you've probably heard about from, cause it's a lot, of, it's in the news now, a lot of companies have been talking about it for some time and that's reskilling and upskilling. So if you want to get to the next level of your current field, think about what skills you need to develop. And this goes back a little bit to that T graph. I showed you a couple slides back. Um, I want you to think about, you know, what are those skills you need to develop to get there? but also think about maybe what's in demand. So if you're looking to grow your expertise or looking to pivot in your career and do something different, what positions is your current organization offering? What positions are you seeing out there you know, quite frequently when you're job searching? You can have a conversation with HR about what they're looking for and the skills they're having trouble finding or you know, positions they're having trouble filling. Um, or other leaders, right? Again, going back to increasing your visibility, maybe talk to them. What are the roles they're having trouble finding really good people for? And then think about, do any of these areas excite me? Again, you don't want to be wasting your time, or maybe I shouldn't say wasting, but spending a lot of your precious time developing skills that don't excite you on things that don't interest you. You want them to be, you know, you want to get good at things you really love. So think about, you know, whether that's the case. Um, and then you can become an, you know, an expert in an area of increasing importance, like artificial intelligence, AI, right? That's the biggest example going around these days. Um, but there are a lot of other areas like data analysis, um, data analytics, and other areas where employers have trouble finding folks, and you can really increase your knowledge. And we're going to talk about ways to do that as well. One is available training. So this does not mean, I just want to be very clear, and it says here, free or paid. And I'm totally serious about that because people say, well, don't I have to do, you know, a course or certification that's paid or an employer won't care? And that is not the case at all. Um, and it's been that way for years, but I will tell you that it's even more true now because of the pandemic. And I just think that employers are also becoming more open to diversity of professional background, diversity of thinking, not everybody, you know, not now you might have seen job descriptions sometimes say nothing about degrees um, or not just the type of degree, but even having a university degree. So things are changing. And yes, it's slow. Some industries are going to be slower to change than others. Um, but I think that we're seeing this and there's a very positive trend. And my point here is that there are trainings that are external and internal and online, in-person, free, paid, a combination. Like you don't need to get the formal, formal education that used to be necessary to get some of these jobs. Um, experience is weighted a lot more heavily even volunteer experience, I would say, is weighted more heavily than it used to be. So that's another opportunity as well. If you can find a way to volunteer your skills strategically in an organization, maybe, you know, maybe it's like part time, a uh, few hours a month, maybe it's on the weekends, you know, say you're in accounting 
uh, but you really want to move into the nonprofit field and become like a program officer or something of that nature, um, you could volunteer to do some like accounting or bookkeeping for a small nonprofit on the side. And that could help you leverage those skills and, you know, get into that field um, and, you know, pivot into a different type of job or, you know, operations or something different, leveraging those skills. So again, you should strategically think about some of the training or maybe even volunteer opportunities that you could undertake. The next piece um, is very, that's very useful is job shadowing and mentorship. And you might say, my company doesn't offer that or, you know, I, I don't think they'll be open to that. But I don't want you to get hung up on whether it's a formal or informal program. It's always possible to try to create something yourself and be a little bit entrepreneurial. So the things that you want to look at are who has a job that interests you, who do you admire at work? This goes back to what we're talking about with the visibility as well. What projects um, are other teams working on where your skills could be an asset, where you have an interest, of course, not just, <laughs> just for any team, but what is interesting to you and could you use your skills there? Job shadowing, you know, is that would be job shadowing, right? So it's kind of like you find an individual you admire or you find a project a team is working on. You get to observe what they're doing, what their days look like, you know, how they approach this project. And that's a really great way to learn. If it's not a formal thing, um, you can ask your boss or even other leaders to join into their meetings. Um, I can tell you that at another point earlier in my um, communications career, um, I actually ended up, you know, there were a couple of times where I felt like I should be at a prospective client meeting or, you know, where they were pitching new business. Um, and I spoke to my manager and um, she was able to make that happen. So, you know, it wasn't always possible, but a couple of times I was able to do it. And I learned a lot about the business development process and sales within the company and how it worked from those experiences. And it exposed me to more senior leaders that were in that meeting. Um, and so all of that was really good, right? So I kind of got, I covered a bunch of bases just with that one meeting, for example. Um, and then mentor relationships can be awkward, I know, because what you don't want to do is go up to someone and say, hey, will you be my mentor? You know, um, that might scare them. So you might want to just try to meet them at a company event or meeting and chat with them before or after. Again, like the visibility piece, try to know their bio, be prepared to ask them some questions related to their expertise or career path. Um, and then, you know, so it's having a chat. It's like you meet somebody at a party or when you're out with your friends. Um, so think of it the same way right? Um, that's how you can develop any relationship, including a mentor relationship. It doesn't have to be formal. It can be just these conversations every once in a while. And then they might say like, you know, if I can help you, let me know. And that's great. And then you can continue the conversation. Maybe you can meet for coffee or video chat. Um, but you know, again, just be, just be relaxed about it and let it kind of happen. Um, and then continue the conversation if things go well. So there's a lot of ongoing learning that you can do. Um, and I know that some of this might seem obvious, but there are so many opportunities to upskill on your own. And I think we often forget about it. Um, you know, I would say that there's just so much out there now because of the internet, because of developments in technology, uh, we're seeing so much is available, right? And I'm, and I'm talking not, again, not paid, um, but free. You can take like short courses from professors at very well-known schools and smaller schools. Um, you can, you know, I personally was searching recently for good 
AI courses because um, our team is looking a lot into that and how it can help our clients and um, help our work streams and what we do. And there are a lot of institutes offering like free training on that because they have these big projects where they're doing it. So it's possible. You can find almost anything. So don't forget about books. <laughs> they still exist. Surprise, surprise. So there are a lot of books about there about all kinds of subjects. Um, that can be a great way to learn. And again, showing self-learning, whether it's a course or books or, you know, teaching yourself is it counts and it should go on your resume. It should go on your LinkedIn profile. Um, you don't have to list like all the books or all the podcasts that you're listening to. No, that's not what I'm saying, but you can make it clear through posting on LinkedIn, for example, and through an entry in your resume that you are self-studying and say what you're self-studying. As long as it's focused, that's what matters. So, you know, you want to focus on what you're trying to do toward your goals that's helping you. Excuse me, I'm talking too much. Um, so, of course, there are the traditional things as well, like online workshops and webinars you can attend. Again, there's a lot out there. There's a lot that are very cheap and some that are free. Um, and these are great ways to increase your learning about a different topic. Um, so say, you know, if you are an attorney and you want to learn about a communications career, um, this is kind of how one of our teammates um, sort of changed careers, career directions. You could take courses on communications, and then there's so many other levels of communications, right? There's, you know, there's public relations, there's internal communications, there's crisis communications. There are so many different, um, you know, areas within that. And then you you can say, you know, that you're self-studying and, and where you're doing it, or you can list, you know, the kind of um, platforms or programs you're using. So I've seen that a lot as well with tech, for example. Uh, we've had a lot of clients who have decided to transition that way and have been self-studying or getting certifications, you know, online, doing all kinds of things. And that also is included in the resume. So um, in-person seminars, of course, have come back strong. So that's another option. A lot of them are offered by universities or different organizations locally. Networking groups are also great. Those you can find online oftentimes or in your local community. Um, associations that are relevant to like professional associations is what I'm talking about. So like there are several for communications, for example, which was my background um, or HR. There's a couple for that, um, you know, higher education. There's all different, you know, all kinds of um, associations. And if you join those, you often are allowed access not only to like the member directory to network, but you also have opportunities to join their lectures and seminars and webinars and things like that. It's a great way to meet people. Um, again, lectures at universities or in local community um, institutions is helpful. Private leadership coaching is also, of course, always a possibility um, to help you pinpoint maybe what it is you want to do. And then personal reflection. Um, Again, this is something everyone says they want to do, and then we never take time to actually do it. Um, and when we sit down with our clients and ask them, you know, customized questions against their background, they tell us it's like it's a reflection and they get all these insights that they didn't even think about or hadn't thought about in years. So one thing you can ask yourself is what do my friends or peers, colleagues call and ask? or, you know, just ask for your advice about text or call, whatever it is. Um, this can be telling because sometimes, you know, it can show that like, if you're a confidant of a lot of people, maybe it means that you are great at protecting, you know, personal information. And if you're like an executive assistant or virtual assistant, or, you know, involved in security, the security field in some way, 
that's a great asset to have. So even if it's like a personal um, skill that you don't think can relate to work, often if you think about it a little bit harder or ask them, even ask them directly, like, what am I good at? That would help you to figure out some, some of those things. Um, another great question to ask yourself is what, you know, think about a great week at work that you've had, or even a great day or a couple of days, doesn't matter. Um, and ask yourself what you are doing. A lot of times, you know, someone might say, uh, well, I was at this conference and I was meeting all these people and I had this great week. Usually I'm just at my desk, behind my desk, not talking to anybody, you know, on, in Zoom meetings or whatever. And if that's the case, maybe you should be in a job that's getting you out and getting you more interaction with people. You know, maybe something like external relations or community outreach um, is, you know, volunteer coordination. Maybe something like that is more your speed or sales in some capacity. So just, you know, personal reflection can be very important. Um, and also the strengths finder assessment. If you're not familiar with it, you can look at it online. It was developed by Gallup. Um, and I find it really effective in helping you figure out what your strengths are. And then through that, you kind of get this narrative that tells you, you know, these are things to watch out for, but here are things that you're really great at and you might consider. So that might also help you figure out the direction you want to take things. And the last piece is about promoting yourself. And I would should say this is last, but very much not least. It is so important. And again, so few of us track um, progress toward goals or track our successes. I'm trying to encourage people to do this all the time um, because we say we're going to do it and then we often don't do it. And what I mean here is, like I said, don't just think about tracking your progress, but track all your successes. So there's different ways you can do that. Um, you could create a spreadsheet if you're a spreadsheet person, uh, like in Excel, and you could track it that way. And what I want you to track is, you know, those set down goals that we talked about earlier uh, that are going to help you maybe get to the next level or help you transition to something totally different. Um, you know, what are those trainings, those learning opportunities? What are the things at work that you need to accomplish or learn? What are those things you need to learn about, not just accomplish? Um, having all of that down and then making sure you mark when it's completed or almost completed, you know, what stage you're at is really important to help you feel motivated and continue your progress. And then you also should sort of set up like a weekly reporting system for yourself, or maybe it's monthly, but make sure you set a day. If it's Friday or the last day of the month, when you make sure you check that spreadsheet or your file, if you, you want to do it, say like in a document, Word or some pages, and make sure that you have, you know, tracked each of those goals and where you're at in it. Um, the other important thing is taking all of the successes. So any kind of positive feedback you've received, if it's in an email, if it's verbally, it could be from a client or your coworkers, make sure you put that into a file, like, you know, a folder on your computer or in your inbox, in your email, collect all of that in one place, however you like to do it, whatever program you like best, uh, because those things are also going to be important when it comes to your review time. Um, and you also, it also helps build you up quite honestly, you know, those small successes are things if you're having a bad day, it's great to go back to and refer to and remind yourself that things aren't always so, um, dreadful or frustrating at work. And that will continue to help you drive toward those goals that you've laid out in your spreadsheet that you're tracking. So this is what I did at my job. Um, you know, that I've been speaking about, I collected all of that positive feedback, saved it in two places, both an email and a folder on my computer. Um, and then I would check back with those goals about every two weeks 
and see, you know, how I was doing and then realize, oh no, you know, I still need to take this training. Like my boss said it was important or I said I was going to complete it by my performance time and making sure I was moving toward that. And then it's very important to advocate for yourself. So, you know, as you've heard me say throughout this presentation, you can't rely on somebody else to recognize you for that work. Doing great work, unfortunately, is not enough. And yes, some people are lucky. Some of you may even be this lucky to have a manager or boss who just recognizes it and comes to you with these opportunities, you know, to do new things and try um, and steer your career in a certain way. But most of us do not have that. And I was the one thing I was lucky about in my situation was I had a colleague who worked side by side with me on our client site. And um, she was very, even though she worked in a different area, we were sort of on the same client team working for the same client, I should say. And she was very helpful in encouraging me about this and saying, don't rely on anyone else to advocate for you because your boss is not here. You're, well, my boss wasn't there and my boss's boss did not sit with me um, at work. Like they visited from time to time or I would go to headquarters and visit, but I almost never saw them. And so she taught me the importance of, so it was almost like remote work, right? So she taught me the importance of making sure I was advocating for myself and I was having these regular check-ins and asking her for meetings or calling her on the phone every once in a while and communicating. So important. So check in with your boss regularly towards, you know, to talk about the goals you've set out. Find a way that they're open to share your successes, like ask them, you know, I'd love to be able to share my progress. How do you prefer to get that? Is it an email? Is it a weekly like one page report or bullets? Um, is it a phone call? Everybody communicates differently and has preferences for that. So it's important that you ask them the question and respect their communication preferences. And that will just help you with the relationship going forward as you're steering things. Um, and so just to you know wrap up my story, what happened was by making myself more seen by my boss's boss, um, and meeting with her regularly, setting out these goals, and then achieving them, tracking them, I was able to get that promotion at my next performance review. And it felt so good to be able to say, you know, I did this. Like, you know, I had that person, like I said, that sort of like a mentor informally who was pushing me and making sure that I was advocating for myself. But in the end, it worked and it felt really good to be able to say like, you know, I did all the things I wanted to accomplish and I made it happen. And again, I, I don't know if I said this before, but I had a, you know, my boss's boss was very absent. Not only was, were they not sitting with me at work every day, they just didn't know my work. They didn't work with my client, like it was very separate. And it was up to me to communicate up and to, you know, to make it happen. So if I can do it, you can do it. You have the power to drive your career forward. Do not wait for someone else to do it for you. That was my mistake early in my career. Make it happen yourself and great things can come of it. So with that, I want to move to questions. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that uh, fantastic information, Marcel. We will go ahead now and turn to our Q&A portion. Um, just as an FYI Mar for you, Marcel, uh, you know, some of these questions definitely touch on things you went over during the presentation, but they are, you know, important topics. So I think they are worth uh, reemphasizing. So with that being said, we will go ahead now uh, and move into our question. So our first one here focuses on changing careers. Uh, this person is interested in changing careers and wants to know what you would recommend if they lack experience in the new field they are trying to transition to what would your recommendation be there thank you that's a great question and one that i see often um and my best advice is a couple of things uh so the first would be you know find out as much as you can you know peruse 
job descriptions of that field and the skills that are being sought. So, uh, you know, don't pay so much attention to like, you know, you need X years of this of experience in this area or this industry, pay more attention to the other skills. Um, and then figure out, okay, are these things that I've already done in my past roles uh, or even in school, if you're like, you know, haven't been out of school for very long. Um, and then, you know, make sure you're collecting that. Second, talk to people in this, in the field that you're interested in. Um, even if you don't know anybody directly in that field or you don't have any second degree connections, um, say on LinkedIn or otherwise, it's okay. Um, reach out, you can reach out. And like I was saying um, about becoming more visible, ask, asking for advice you know, is different than asking for a job. So saying, look, I'm looking to transition, say you know, from law into the tech field, and I'd love to talk to you about you know, your career path in tech and your experience at X organization or whatever it is. That's the second thing I would suggest, talk to people. I have seen so many people get jobs by doing that. N number one, figuring out exactly what they want to do in this new industry or sector, um, exactly, or which has led, I should say, to an opportunity to interview or a new position and an offer. So definitely do that, uh, build your network. Um, and then the third thing, of course, would be from this information you've gathered, so perusing the job descriptions and speaking with people in the field, um, do what you need to do. So, you know, study, read, um, go to webinars, whatever it is to try to increase your skills that you've learned about from each of those, um, the conversations and from, you know, reading those job descriptions. Wonderful. Thank you for providing that advice. So our next question, which has quite a few upvotes, uh, this person is a little bit more uh, advanced in their career and they would like to find a new job, but they are concerned about the potential of age discrimination. So what kind of advice would you give to someone like that? Great question. So what we actually do is we don't put um, like years that you've received your degree on a resume and so for example like it just it doesn't matter anymore unless somebody's graduated say within the past five years we don't include it that helps a little bit um the other thing that helps is including mostly details more you know job description work experience details in your resume uh, with the past 10 years of your career and then not doing so past that However, you know, if that information is very relevant, we do recommend that people include it if it's relevant to where you're trying to go next. Um, you do want some details about those past roles, but in general, that sort of helps take away some of that issue and like the concentration that employers might make on, you know, how many years of experience does this person really have or how old are they? <clears throat> I would say... I get a lot of folks who are concerned about this and don't need to be. So again, I don't know what all of what industries you're all working in, but I do find that even though that's a common article that you'll see online and, and topic written about, it's often that people think, um, well, how can I say this? Like it's more, it, it, there's less of it going on than you think, I would say. So like, yes, in some, you know, tech, for example, they try to hire, you know, younger people, maybe at lower salaries um, with less experience in their career. But there are so many careers out there where more experience and knowledge and connections are required. So I wouldn't necessarily be so afraid, depending on your industry, it might actually be an asset rather than a drawback. 
right, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so let's see, our next question here uh, has to do with a little bit of an employment gap. You know, this person wants to know uh, potential best practices for landing a job and ideally, you know, negotiating a, a higher salary than their previous job, but they have been out of the workforce for about two years. So how would you, uh, you know, in, uh, manage a, a career break without having to take a big hit to, you know, your salary? I think that this is less of an issue these days. Um, gaps of just something like two years is not a big deal. I mean, we even see them of more than that, and it hasn't been a problem uh, for people getting jobs. I think that you really need to just make sure that you know what's competitive. So if you make sure you do research to figure out you know, what the going salary is for the job level that's appropriate for you or that you're trying to get to next um, post career gap in your, you know, I would say in your geographic location, but that's even changing because with remote work now, you know, that changes things a little bit as well. But if you can find in your location, um, some examples, um, and then, you know, people with, the same amount of experience at that same level, uh, what are their salaries looking like so that you're armed with that information. Um, I just, I don't, I think a lot of people are worried that the gap is really going to put them back. And most employers are, um, or many employers, I should say, are, you know, understand like things happen the pandemic was a very big disruption in everybody's life worldwide and people had to take care of others people got lost their jobs like life happens and now they're more sensitive to that so go in with the confidence of this is how much i know people make in my industry my field and my location and this is what i deserve and ask for it and make sure with negotiations, um, hopefully this will help many of you. I always tell people to start the lowest part of your range should be something you'd be really excited about. I think too often, if we're giving a salary range and negotiating these things, we present, you know, this range we think that will be amenable to them. I want you to think about what's right for you and what would make you super excited. And that should be the lowest amount that you start with. Yeah, salary negotiation is a, a very tricky topic for a lot of people. So thank you for addressing that. I, I would like to ask my own sort of follow up here, uh, focus more on the career break. You know, how do you in your resume, in interviews, you know, how do you go about addressing a career break in a way that is not going to uh, have employers sort of imagine red flags about you? Yes, thank you for that question. So sometimes if you I don't think you necessarily have to do this in the resume, but we have done this. If you feel very uncomfortable and you're like worried about addressing it in the hiring process, go ahead and put it in your resume. You can put, you know, just a line that explains what was happening. Like sometimes it's, you know, um, cared for a sick family member or cared for children or spouse job relocated, you know, um, our family or something like that. Um, that works pretty well because then you're being transparent. You're leaving less imagine, less things open to the imagination of the employer because, as you know, they look at resumes quickly. They infer all kinds of things. So the less information left to their imagination, the better. So if you feel comfortable with that, you don't need to have specifics, but put something basic. Um, you don't have to, you can just leave it as is if you feel more comfortable that way. Um, and then if it comes up in an interview situation, you know, you can explain it in a cover letter as well. I should say that. Um, but if it comes up in an interview, just be ready to explain it. And again, they shouldn't be digging for like all the personal details or if you were sick, like you, you know, you shouldn't have to tell them all of that information. Um, I would say, you know, just come up with your answer ahead of time and, um, you know, and just be very positive and enthusiastic. And so if it's that you took time off to raise a child and now you really want to get back to work, 
tell them why you're so excited about coming back to work. Right. And like, um, you can even make light of it in a way, you know, and say like, well, I've been do and talk about the skills you've been using as a parent or having cared for somebody sick and solving problems and being flexible and all these things. It shows that you're very like, you know, smart and um, the way that you're thinking about things and that you're also very enthusiastic and excited. And uh, again, a lot of employers are realizing that people that are that dedicated and want to return after having a difficult period or having raised children and, you know, it's a very hard job, as many of you know, that is something that they value. So just be positive and be kind of excited about the next step and what you can bring. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so this next question is focused on advice for young graduates or you know professionals who are maybe early on in their career have very limited experience. Uh, you know this person mentioned that they are encountering those those dreaded entry level positions that are asking for X plus years of experience in very specific skills. You know finding that uh, it seems like employers don't really want to train young career starters on the job anymore. So just any kind of advice that you would would uh, recommend for this person? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, and I, I hear you because I see those job descriptions a lot. Um, one thing that you, you know, you might think about again is sort of what I was talking about volunteering strategically is something you could try to do. Um, again, it doesn't have to eat up a lot of your time and, you know, job searching takes up a lot of time. So but if you could offer to an organization of interest, excuse me, to help them with, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to get into, um, maybe it's, you know, writing or editing and proofreading something related to that. Um, or, you know, even just like evaluating their operations, something depending on what your skills are and what you want to do, that can be a great way to add to your resume. Um, and of course, if you're doing that unpaid, a lot of organizations might be <laughs> open to it. Um, that's one way. Um, and then making sure that your resume is like really built out. And what I mean by that is, um, yes, they might be saying, you know, we want one to three years experience and you don't have that yet that's kind of what like a nice to have, you know, job descriptions are still in many cases, very generic, uh, hard to decipher. Sometimes I'm not even sure that the hiring managers know what's in the job description because they have their own view of what they want. And maybe someone in HR doesn't know really, and has drafted something totally different and they sign off on it because they just need to get someone in the door. So don't take it as like, the final word, like I have to have all of these and this exact number of years of work experience. But when I say build out your resume, what I mean is like, again, think strategically about, okay, are there courses that I took, like that I need that I should list on my resume? Or are there um, projects that I worked on in school that I should list on my resume? Uh, maybe there was interesting things that you did that would attract someone, you know, and help you stand out from someone else. Like if you are, you know, do karate or Taekwondo or who knows, uh, whatever it is, make sure all of that's on there. Cause that can help you stand out. And it also honestly can't hurt. Like I keep <laughs> driving home over and over again is to try to build relationships again and just seek advice from people and build your network and see what happens. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more question here. Uh, and so this one is, is one that I really like. Uh, you know, this person mentioned that the, the tips and advice that you shared throughout the presentation seem to be, you know, fairly focused on how to get promoted within your current organization or or move into uh, higher level positions. But so when we're thinking about things like, uh, you know, pursuing training, increasing your visibility, reskilling and up, upskilling, job shadowing and mentorship, you know, how do you envision those applying to getting a new job or, or starting your career? I know you've touched on that a little bit already, but, you know, where how can people take these things that you've mentioned and really kind of launch into a new job? job. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and I probably should have been more explicit about that. So if 
when you're, you know, going for this new job, it's similar, right? You need to, you have to be visible. So it's the same principle. Like you're not looking internally necessarily. If you're looking for a new job or making a pivot, you want to be talking to people outside of the company. Um, or maybe even people internally who've worked in other places. That's an opportunity too, uh, who might be able to connect you to people in other places that you're interested in. Um, so you want to think about what are your targets, right? Like, are there companies that you really admire? So not just people, but, you know, companies. Are there um, industries that you both do and don't? It's important to know what you don't want to do too. Don't want to work in. Um, and then you know, start talking, even if there's not jobs listed at some of these companies that you admire or are interested in, find people to talk to. And again, you know, seek that advice, reach out to them and start talking and help you. I've seen so many people, like I said, get jobs that way um, just through talking to people. And literally, I've had several clients who never ended up applying blindly online. They just had their materials ready, felt confident went out and started making connections and asking people just about their careers and it helped them define what they wanted to do and ended up with interviews and job offers. So it works. Um, that's probably the biggest thing in terms of job shadowing and mentoring. You can, I mean, you could ask that of somebody externally. It doesn't have to be someone internally. So maybe you go out and kind of informally find a mentor um, and, you know, develop that relationship, uh, who's doing something you eventually want to do, or is in the job you want to be in, in a few years or sooner, um, you know, have conversations with them, ask them for advice about, are there opportunities, you know, for me to job shadow or learn, or, you know, just ask a lot of questions really. Um, and people love talking about themselves. So it's a great way to, to help you figure out, you know, get to something else. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, really, again, it sounds very simple, but talking to people um, and building these relationships is what's going to help you get to where you want to be. Um, so that's, that's probably my best advice there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcel. We, we really appreciate your time today. I think that's all that we're going to have time for today. So we will go ahead and close out our webinar. Again, a big thank you to you, Marcel, for joining us and providing so many great insights. And thank you to everyone who attended today. As a reminder, uh, sometime later this week, you will receive an email with a copy of the recording. And on behalf of Flex Jobs and our career experts team, I wish you all the best of luck in your job search. So Thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.